Hi everyone and welcome to today's PassFax WA webinar. My name is Cindy Webster and I am the PassFax WA newsletter editor and project lead. I'm also hosting and presenting in the webinar today and we have Jeanette Pratt co-hosting behind the scenes. So this webinar has been funded by the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development and GRDC under the IPM for Greens Best Practice Inset Pest Management Project. And Ian, if you can please move to the next slide, I'll just talk quickly about our agenda for the day. Thank you. So first off, we have Ian Foster talking about the climate outlook for WA's growing season. We will then have Svetlana Mitchich talking about what pest growers need to be looking out for this season. And I'll be finishing off talking about the pest facts service and what we have been working on behind the scenes. We will be finishing up with a question and answer session. So please use the Q&A tool down the bottom of your screen to ask your questions for our presenters. And we'll just keep the presentation flowing and answer questions at the end. We will be keeping all attendees, uh, microphones and cameras muted and turned off just to try and increase the sound quality of our webinar. And we will be uploading the webinar recording to the DeepHerd YouTube channel afterwards, and we'll also circulate our PowerPoint slides. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you. Good morning all and welcome. I'll start with a brief recap of um, the summer and this is December to uh, February period and for the southern part of Western Australia as you can see that the map on the left that just shows the rainfall deciles for this period and it probably comes to no surprise to many people it was actually it, it was very very dry. More of a normal season for the Kimberleys and the Pilbara though, so though there were some patches of dry up there. Large contrast to Eastern Australia, where, as you know from the news, the floods are actually continuing there. Several things contributing to that, the La Nina event in the Pacific Ocean. There was a pattern in the Southern Hemisphere called the Southern Annular Mode, which if it, in summer in that mode, it brings more onshore winds to the um, Southeast coast. So it added to the La Nina. And the third thing that added to the whole excitement over there is the fact that the sea surface temperatures were, were warmer. So whilst they have been un underwater, uh, until the start of March, most of Southern WA was actually pretty, pretty dry. The other big story that you'll all be aware of, it's been pretty much record breaking temperatures. Um, this pattern that was contributing to the rain there was actually contributing to very strong easterlies over Western Australia. So the West Coast in particular got cooked, new records set for the North, and it was also hot at night. So the stories for the South, the cropping areas, the summer, or at least until the, the, you know, the traditional summer till the end of February, um, was very hot and very dry. Since then, um, in and so that's just the uh, that's just an example to show you. This is just the total rainfall. So it's all very well looking at the deciles. This is just showing the actual amounts of rain. So you can see that in many places throughout the central grain belt, there you actually had less than ten millimeters for that three month period. So it was particularly dry all up and down here. So it was really you know dry relatively, but also dry in terms of absolute amounts. The normal south coastal area picks up little bits during the summer anyway. So that had been the story where there'd been very little actual rain and also been very hot. Stepping on to um, March, um, we've actually seen uh, uh, the, the summer rains decided to kick off a bit. And this is actually the rainfall totals for all of March now. So there have been some tropical cyclones and lows that have delivered stuff for the Kimberleys. But the interest for us in the last, second part of the month has been the, um, the remnants of ex-tropical cyclone Charlotte that didn't actually cross the coast, it ran down close to the coast, but didn't actually cross. It's gone back up and merged with other things, um, but it's generated a lot of rain, especially throughout this uh, southern rangelands, but getting right into the northern grain belt, the Geraldton area, northeast, and getting right down through the eastern grain belt as well. So we've seen this sort of summer rain now out in these eastern areas, and that's been actually kicking off some people starting to very early seeding. The lower west um, hasn't picked up much at all. And Perth in particular seems to have been a particular island in all of this rainfall, um, which pretty much nothing's happened. So the story there that the some areas of the eastern and northern grain belt have actually picked up some very useful rain that if anything allows early seeding opportunities um, and or soil moisture gains. 
Now, the chart on the right was one that Meredith did a few days ago. We had to wait a few days to get the data to be up, updated. So this bit here has now been filled in. But this was looking at the total amount of rainfall. In some places, they've got 90 plus millimetres at um, Goodlands and Kalani area, that sort of thing. So it's so it's really kicking off these areas you'll see now. That look, and Una the other day picked up some useful falls. So it's really starting to kick off through these areas that would really benefit from soil moisture early in the season. These wet areas to the um, to the west here have got the opportunity for pick up later in the growing season, so it's maybe not quite as critical. Just a, a quick recap of what's going on globally at the moment. This is the the sea, sea surface temperature anomaly, and it shows the classic shape of the cooler ocean temperatures in the eastern Pacific. That's the La Nina, and an arc of warmer sea surface temperatures both north and south of the equator. But as well as that, we've got warm oceans in the Tasman Sea and around WH. So these are the, this is the La Nina pattern. It's still there. It's on the way out, but it's still going to persist for a month or two. But in any event, we've got north of the country, but also all around us, we've got warmer sea surface temperatures. So that says that if you do get a system that can actually generate some uplift and some convergence, you've actually got a reasonably good supply of moisture. And that's probably one of the reasons why in some of these areas in the grain belt, there's been so much rain because it's actually been fed by these warmer oceans. And that of course has also been driving things in East, Eastern Australia because when the East Coast lows crank up, they've got a ready source of moisture. Looking at the outlook for the next three months and then the and then jumping forward um, a month after that. This is the latest runs from the Bureau of Meteorology's Access S model. They were just updated yesterday as it turned out. Now they show the rainfall for the next three months, in this case, as a chance of exceeding median. So the colours are such that if it's these greeny blue colours, there's a high chance of exceeding the median. It doesn't say by how much, it just says a chance of being above or below median. So it's suggesting maybe some lingering late season rainfall for the north, because it's normally decreasing, and also still for the east coast, some chance of, of rain are continuing. Most of these lighter colours here mean the model's got a completely neutral outlook. That is, the chances of being above or below median are pretty much the same. So effectively for April, May, June, for grain belt and WA, it's not providing any guidance. So that just means there's nothing going on at the moment that persists its signal through time that's, that's pushing the rainfall probabilities around. So that means in terms of what might happen, you're looking at really the sort of week, you know, week to two weeks weather outlooks as such as your main guidance. For this longer period system, um, there's no particular guidance for our part of the world coming out of the model. When you step forward one month to the May to July, there's some hints of a maybe of a slightly drier start for these areas. Now, this, these brownie colours, there's maybe 40% or so chance of exceeding median according to the Bureau's model. But interestingly, it's spatially coherent in that these are areas along here that get the winter rainfall. So, and this is coming from the implication that May could actually be fairly dry. Now, this is what's been going on certainly for our part of the world for the past 30, 40 years. So it's nothing unusual from that point of view. Um, but it just does hint that the, the start of, the, of our main winter growing season may be a bit patchier than we'd have liked. So it's certainly not shaping up like it was last year as such. The two charts at the bottom are the historical skill maps for these times of year from the Bureau's model. Ideally, so this is uh, the accuracy in terms of percent correct. Ideally, you want the darker colours. So they've got higher skills for Eastern Australia, but only moderate skill for April, May, June um, for a WA and for a May to July outlook initialized in late March, it's got relatively low skill, a little bit better, you know, 50 to 65%. So it's got some skill, but you wouldn't necessarily hang, hang your hat on it. So the thing with these sorts of things is that you watch the updates. The Bureau will update these things once a week or so. And so you'll see if the pattern changes. And if as this period gets progressively closer, they still continue this idea of this area being maybe drier than normal, then perhaps it's actually starting to detect a bit of a signal. So just watch this space. But for the moment, the next three months, it's just completely sitting on the fence. Oops. Um, you can have a look at multi-model uh, runs from international services. So these, these are three examples of multi-model ensembles. The top left, left is from a US system where it looks at a set of North American models. 
The same idea, just the probabilities of rain being in different categories. In this case, they're just looking above, above or below normal. Um, some hint of it, they're expecting maybe slightly wetter conditions for or leaning that way for East Australia, but nothing for WA. So that's sort of a consistent spatial pattern to the Bureau of Nets. The one here is a European one from ECMWF and others. So when you stick them all in the pot and stir it up together, you do tend to get a bit of a grey porridge. Individual models have stronger or weaker probabilities in this case, but they show a similar pattern in the eastern parts of the country. Yes, rainfall probabilities, a little bit wetter than average, not huge. And Western Australia, maybe some lingering there. Um, not sure how much faith you can put in that. It's probably coming from being driven from the warmer sea surface temperatures. But in any event, it's a, very, it's a pretty weak signal. And this bottom left here is um, a is a Korean multi-model ensemble from a range of international models. A similar sort of a picture, a bit sort of bland and not really exciting for Western Australia. So again, none of the international models are indicating Western Australia to be particularly wet in this period, put it this way. At best, they've got maybe a slight leaning towards it and mostly they'd be, just be neutral. So there's not really a strong signal at this stage coming out of the international models. So just to recap, the traditional summer rain has been very much below average, especially in the south. Uh, March has actually seen um, most of the summer rain activity for the south, though it's, it's been a bit patchy. That's mostly the northeast and eastern region, so I'm sure that's welcome for them. Summer, as you're all aware, was very hot. Um, the La Nina in the Pacific Ocean is still hanging on. It's lingering about, but it's, it'll, it'll go within a month or two. Um, so that's good. Uh, the autumn rain outlooks um, are just pretty much neutral and the Bureau of Met model has a slightly dry preference. So we'll again watch that for the updates. Um, the predictive skill of the climate models at this time of year is not that flash. So you can maybe take the outlooks with a grain of salt perhaps. One thing that is very consistent is they all expect autumn temperatures to continue to be warmer than normal. That seems to be, well, pretty, not to make a pun, it's baked in at the moment that we just get warmer temperatures. So I will end at that point. And if you want me to hand back to Cindy, I'll do that. Thanks, Ian. Now feel free, um, Svetlana will jump straight in with her presentation. As we've got uh, warmer temperatures and others and uh, less rainfall being predicted for the southern parts of our state and parts of our landscape, um, I thought I'd give you an update of what pests to expect. However, I would like to say that even though we've had a very, very dry summer, we can't rely on the dry summer to have gotten rid of our green bridge completely. So GPIRD has just finished undertaking a green bridge surveillance survey. So what we've done is driven around the landscape. So you can see from this map, the red dots are where we didn't find a green bridge with annual winter or brassica brassicas in it and the green dots are where we actually did. So you can see from the southern parts of the state, we have found quite a bit of a green bridge and the green bridge is directly related to the rainfall up to the 20th of March. What does that mean for the pests that we have? Well, if you actually look at what was in the green bridge, the yellow dots with the green around them are where we found brassicas and again, I had expected to only found brassicas in the south, but we are finding them in the central and uh, eastern wheatbelt areas, but we are finding quite a lot of uh, annual cereals. And what that does mean is any pest that uses brassicas or cereals as a host is probably likely to have persisted there. What we will be doing and the results will be available in pest facts um, from about mid April onwards is we are looking at where the diamondback moth are in relation to the brassicas. So we've got pheromone traps out throughout the landscape. And I thought we'd just give a quick recap of what we can expect. Because last year, you all remember, was a very wet. We had a green bridge that extended from pretty much Geraldton all the way through to Esperance. We had 285 uh, DVM traps throughout uh, March and April. And what we found was that, that we were collect finding that diamondback moth was present in our landscape. However, when the, uh, red, the dots here indicate which focus crops we actually looked at, which were close to 
paddocks which were close to traps that had DBM in there, what we actually found, and if you look here on the left hand side is the number of moths, the right hand side here is the number of larvae and this is the time period. There does not seem to have been a correlation between caterpillars in crops and a green bridge. What we have found is the correlation between finding moths between June and July, that indicates that there's going to be a hot spot of caterpillars. But last year, even though we had DBM early in the season, we actually did not have any of our paddocks reach threshold. And that's probably got more to do with the fact that last year our winter was quite cold. This year, if we are looking at below median rainfall and warmer conditions, we can expect that DBM may be an issue. And really, I'd suggest that you look out for pest facts where we have our traps up. And if the traps are showing that we are having a uh, spike in DBM numbers from June to July, it might be an idea to start monitoring crops because DBM is really an issue when we have warmer conditions. And I had expected not to see, not to find any green bridge, but really the February, March rainfall has led to a green bridge in part. So what that means is the moths are in the landscape, even though they may not be, um, even though the green bridge may not be a indicator that uh, moths will necessarily be in the paddock. One other pest to look out for, fall armyworm. As, the, as you would have seen from Ian's maps, we've had rainfall in the north and an extended rainfall in the northern ag region means that this pest will have survived quite happily. The fall armyworm is a tropical pest. Um, this year, the department will not be undertaking formal surveillance for fall armyworm. We will be relying on agronomists and industry to keep an eye out. Uh, the main reason for not undertaking surveillance is the pheromone trapping for fall armyworm isn't very specific and there is a lot of bycatch. However, having said that, if you are interested, we do have traps that can be used and we're happy to undertake dissections uh, to determine whether it is fall armyworm that's found in the traps. So please contact us if you'd like to host a trap. Uh, the way to tell fall armyworm, four dots on the back end and a trapezoidal shape of, of um, four dots in the middle and a Y-shaped um, on the and front end, but there are a few other moth species that may look similar. Please feel free to take samples. Please feel free to send them in and we will definitely um, identify it. Uh, please contact PestFax if you like a kit. But what I'd like to do is just a quick recap of what the fall army worm traps in 2021 found. So what we actually did find was adult moths in our broadacre growing areas. So in Geraldton and just um, west of Perth, east of Perth, sorry. No caterpillars were found in broadacre crops. However, at Jinjin, Jin, caterpillars were found. Now, being a tropical pest, what we expect is that if we have warmer conditions in our growing areas, we can expect this pest to migrate. It is very good at migrating. And we would really appreciate if you're out there and you see something that you don't know what it is, please take a photo, please collect a sample so that we can identify it. And if you, again, if you'd like to host a trap, please just contact us and we, that can be arranged. Um, and I've just gone through that, but just keep an eye on pest facts and we will have uh, some fall armyworm traps in the south. Um, maybe this year we'll get some something in there and we'll definitely be letting industry know through pest facts and the DBM survey results again will be extended through pest facts. Another one, Russian wheat aphid. Now, most of you will know this is a new pest in our part of the world. In 2020, you can see it was just in Esperance, the Green Bridge uh, between 2020 and 2021 led to its expansion all the way through to east of Perth. Again, with the lack of a Green Bridge, 
just because we haven't had widespread rainfall throughout our broadacre growing areas doesn't mean this pest hasn't persisted. It has a very wide host range, especially for grasses. And I fully anticipate that it will be present in the landscape. Its movement into crop is likely to be limited um, due to the lack of widespread um, host plants. However, if grasses, especially in the vicinity of paddocks and especially barley grass haven't been effectively controlled, we can expect movement into crop. This particular pest, as you all will be aware, does cause the pink striping on the cereal leaves, very obvious feeding damage. However, that's not an indicator of that the pest is actually present on the plant. You do need to unfurl leaves and have a look because this particular species, when it feeds on the plant and then moves on, the plant can still exhibit feeding symptom damage. So that's not a very good indicator that it's actually present. And I just thought I'd just show you a quick results from a trial that we've just finished with Intergrain last year, where we looked at the use of seed dressings and what it actually did to protect uh, a, a barley variety from Russian wheat aphid. And what we found was that if the crop did have a seed dressing applied, we didn't get a yield loss. If it didn't, we did get a yield loss. And in this case, in the untreated crop, the nil, um, it was the number of Russian wheat aphid per tiller was well above the threshold levels. So this particular pest does can cause damage up to growth stage 50 in the cereals. So it does require regular monitoring from growth stage 30 to 50. The threshold does change based on the growth stage, um, the time till head emergence. So even though we've had no green bridge, there is still sufficient green in the southern parts of our landscape for Russian wheat aphid especially to survive. The central ag areas, look, I expect less incidents than what we had last year. And to really monitor crops, especially those that have not had a seed dressing applied. What about the other aphid species like corn and oat? This particular species, again, really associated with the green bridge. We expect very low incidence and very low incidence of BYDV because we haven't had the volunteer cereals across the landscape as well. So we expect low levels of the corn and oat aphid. However, as you remember from my map, in the southern parts of um, WA, we did have a lot of radish and that is a host plant for the green peach aphid. Now, just to give you an idea, we are again undertaking surveillance for the incidence of turnip yellows virus um, with that can be found within green peach aphid. We expect there'll be lower um, incidences. The yellow squares throughout this map indicate where we've put up traps for green peach aphid to determine whether or not they do have uh, turnip yellows virus in them. Again, it will be extended through pest facts. The traps will be picked up from mid-April. We expect that it may be more of an issue in the southern parts of the state rather than the north. But if we are having a warmer than average season, we can expect numbers of green peach aphid to increase. So please keep an eye on pest facts because green peach aphid, as you're all very well aware, has developed resistance to quite a few insecticides. It's delivered, it's also developed low levels of resistance to sulfoxiflor. So please have a look and only spray for this pest if you absolutely have to, because it does develop resistance quite readily to insecticides. Now, on another note, just because we've had a hot dry summer, please don't expect that you're not going to have any pest issues. For those of you that are in the south, black keel slugs and snails will survive a hot, dry summer very, very effectively. Uh, the reticulated slugs, they're the species that live above ground and don't have, tend to burrow, don't tend to survive hot, dry summers, but black keel slugs definitely will. Now for slugs, you can bait straight after seeding and get a really good control of this pest. However, for snails, 
baiting straight after seeding does not necessarily mean you will get good control. This year, we've been looking at when the albumin gland develops. So I've had some farmers sending in snails from the South Stirlings. So you can see this box on the right here. Um, this is the album gland from snails that were dissected, that were collected on the 10th of March and dissected pretty much soon after. You can see the gland's very small. This on the right is the gland of a similar size snail that was dissected 20 days later. And you can see that it's got quite an enlarged gland and we really do expect that with albumin glands increasing in size, that egg laying will occur because the snail needs to have a well-developed well albumin gland for eggs laying to occur. So we're expecting egg laying to occur in from about mid-April for this population. However, having said that, as in every population, there's some snails will start laying eggs earlier and some will start laying eggs later. But that's just an indicator that the majority of the population is expected to have started laying eggs from about mid-April. And if you do apply baits, just bear in mind that for snails, you may not get very good kill rates. Right now, the um, snails that we dissected earlier, oh, sorry, later, had lots of food in their guts. So that indicates that they're actively feeding and we fully anticipate they've been actively mating as well. But I didn't want to forget some of the other pests that we do have. Uh, so for instance, there's the ant, the weevil, a, a, European earwigs and vegetable beetle will all survive hot, dry summers. European earwig and vegetable beetle are especially an issue when we have warmer starts to the season. And we can expect that if temperatures are above 15 degrees, Daytime temperatures that vegetable beetle can especially be an issue for germinating canola and even canola that is at the five leaf stage. So you can see here on the right hand side, this is a vegetable beetle um, actively feeding on a five leaf canola. With the hot dry summer, the good news is that grasshopper and locust activity will have decreased across part of our landscape. However, we still have resident populations of Australian plague locusts, especially in the southern region around Esperance. And we also have had some persistence of the grasshopper species, especially around the Karoo area. <laughs> there will be localised issues. Um, from Ian's map, you will all have seen the increased rainfall, especially in the non-agricultural regions of the Nullarbor. We are getting reports of grasshopper and locust activity from those areas. We're not anticipating any movement into broadacre growing areas. However, we are, the department is undertaking surveillance, targeted surveillance, just to um, ensure that that doesn't occur. Now, I just thought I'd give you a very quick update about um, a biological control for red-legged earth mites, which was released in the 1990s. We have gone back and checked and found that it has persisted. Again, this is only suitable for long-term pasture and pasture paddocks that are not going to be cropped. We have found that it has persisted from Karoo all the way through to Boyup Brook Manjmup. Um, we do have nursery sites where any grower is welcome to contact the department and we can arrange collections to occur. Again, it's only suitable for growers who are not utilising sprays um, in spring for red-legged earth mites and are looking maybe more at the organic market for their meat. But contact us if anyone's interested. And on that note, red-legged earth mites. We, last year, we found half the sites that we actually uh, tested were, the populations were resistant to synthetic pyrethroids and 20% of the sites we had cross resistance to organophosphates and synthetic pyrethroids. So what that means is look at the sprays you're applying in season. The non-target pests like red-legged earth mites and other aphid pests will get a dose and are possibly liable to get resistance occurring. Um, if you find that you've got more red-legged earth mites surviving than what you anticipated in your paddocks, I'd suggest that maybe you might like to get your um, paddocks tested for resistance this year. So Cindy, you can take over. 
and but I'll still have a little bit more of a chat just about the red legged earth mites. Um, just please contact Pestfax to get your red legged earth mites tested and we would really like it if um, you see anything unusual to contact us please. Thanks very much Svet. And so just very quickly, as I'm aware that we're coming to the end of our half an hour. So very quickly, we have, you might have noticed we have a new name. PESFAX is now called PESFAX WA. And a little bit of history, uh, the fax was in the name because since 1996, when the current service started, the newsletter used to be sent out via fax. So we've just currently changed the name over to slightly, slightly different, um, a slightly different name. And so that means that we do still want to hear about all the pests and plant diseases that you're finding out in your crops and pastures. In return, you can get a free, you will get a free diagnosis, you can get some management advice and so forth. At the moment, um, there's several ways that you can do this. You can use our, old, our current Pest Facts Reporter app, but we are working on a new app and I'll speak about that shortly. Or you can feel free to email the team on the email address mentioned on the screen. We will be continuing on with our newsletter this year. This year, uh, we distribute, distribute it Fridays on a weekly or as needed basis, just depending on how busy the season is. So basically, when we receive reports from a field, we then alert the industry of what has been found and we provide information on how to identify that pest or disease and how to sustainably manage it with an integrated pest management and integrated disease management focus and where you can find more information. As I mentioned, we have been working on making a new app. And so this app will be suitable for all the latest mobile devices, and it will be even more user-friendly than our old one. So it's quite exciting, and hopefully we should have this available soon. So watch this space. We'll let you know when it's available for growers and consultants and researchers to use. We have also been busy upgrading our maps. Uh, for those that might not have heard about it before, the pest facts map displays all the pests and insect, insect reports that the pest facts service has received since 1996. And down the bottom, you can see our senior app developer, Steve Collins, who has been working on this map. He's been doing an awesome job. And so we are basically um, upgrading the display and making it even more user friendly. And one of the upgrades that we are doing is that users will now be able to, be able to generate four maps at once. And this is a great feature for if you want to compare um, four different pests movement in one season, if you want to compare dumb and bat moth reports over four different seasons, you just set the parameters and you can have a really nice display of pests and disease activity. And the more reports that we receive, the more that we can populate that field. And it's just a great tool for the industry, industry to use. We have also just published our 2022 Autumn Winter Insecticide Guide. So feel free to go to our website and download it. This is for controlling pests. This uses a guideline for controlling pests in crops and pastures. And just to round us up, so feel free to email the team if you wish to subscribe to the newsletter, if you haven't already done so. If you wish to host a trap to catch full armyworm and native budworm this season. If you wish to send in invertebrate pests, just to confirm what you are finding, we have vials to do that. And if you wish more information about the mite that Svet was earlier talking about, please feel free to email us asking for more information. And for more detail about the topics that um, specifically Svet and I present, just presented about, these are the links that you can go to. We are also contributing to the Deep Herds Grain Con Grains Combo podcast series. And we have just recently published a podcast about managing snails in broadacre crops. Um, Svetlana did an interview about that one. So feel free to go and check that out, especially for all the growers that will be sitting on their tractors for hours and end or very soon. This might be a great one to add to your playlist. And we are also very active on Twitter. So feel free to go and follow the Deep Herd Broadacre account and look for the Pest Facts WA tweets. And that brings us to the Q&A tool part of the session. And so I'm just going to quickly see if anything has come in. Um, nothing is appearing that I can. Oh, we do. Apologies. We do have one. Oh, we have. Thank you very much. 
for your presentation. Svetlana, this question is for you. What would be better for be a better control of snails if bait after sowing is not effective as it is for slugs? Unfortunately, it's a, it depends on what your farming system is. So baits are the only control you can put in place at the time of seeding. So if you've done nothing before the crop is to be sown, your only option is baits. And the problem is that it is random encounter that in that, that the snail will actually feed on a bait so you need to have an even bait spread you need at least 40 bait points per square meter but the problem is that sometimes the snails just don't feed on the baits and so you can get up to a 60 percent kill um, and that may not be enough to stop damage occurring to a germinating crop what you are better off doing is if you have snails is looking at after harvest, what control mechanisms you can put in place. So there are a number of controls that do involve burning. So that's again why it does depend on what your soil type is. But um, if at the time of sowing, it's just that you have to budget for more than one bait. Great, thanks very much, Fet. And we do not have any more questions. So I think we'll conclude our webinar for the day. We have gone slightly over. As I previously mentioned, um, this webinar recording will be put on the DPED YouTube channel and we will circulate slides around for anyone who would like them. And so these are the presenter contact details. If you wish to contact us, if you think of any questions after the webinar, uh, please feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to have a chat. And this is also further acknowledging the IPM for Greens project that has funded the webinar today. And to finish off, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And we hope that you have found this webinar useful. I'd like to say a big thank you to Ian and Svetlana for presenting to us today and thank you Jeanette Pratt for co-hosting behind the scenes and we will say goodbye for now and we just hope that you have a great rest of your day and we hope to hear from you soon. Okay. Thanks, bye everyone. <laughs>